As some of you know, in the summer of 2021, I was diagnosed with stage 3 pancreatic cancer. As my chances for a long life are slim to none, I decided to record a few thoughts in the hopes that maybe my experience can help someone else. I asked Lisa to post this upon my eventual demise, so if you're seeing this, then I've lost the battle. If you weren't aware of my condition, or if you didn't know I was close to the end, well, my apologies. I'm a private person by nature, and I just haven't wanted to talk about it. We told our immediate family, we told a handful of friends from various circles. We didn't really want it shared all over Facebook or anything like that. I've been trying to maintain an air of optimism also. Part of that has been a facade, I admit. But another part is genuine optimism, because I know the probability of surviving this is not zero. On the other hand, I'm a realist, and I know it's pretty damn close to zero. There are things that I want to say, but frankly, I don't want people looking at me with pity when I say it. It's not that I don't appreciate the thoughts and concerns, but it's depressing to think about, and it's even more depressing to have people looking at me like they know I'm dying. So I've decided to tell it to the camera. Maybe my story will help someone else cope with their situation. I'm calling this Dr. Lombardo's last lecture. I promise not to make this a woe is me talk. In fact, most of it is a message of gratitude. But first, a little serious note. Cancer is a fucking cruel disease, and pancreatic cancer is one of the most vicious. It comes out of nowhere. It's aggressive. It's relentless. And from what I've read, it brings about a pretty miserable demise. I suspect that by the time I draw my last breath, death will have come as a welcome relief. In the meantime, though, I'm doing whatever I can to enjoy whatever time I have left, as much as I can, in spite of the symptoms that are brought about by the disease itself and the treatments. First, I have some advice for you. Get multiple opinions. If I had done so, maybe they would have caught this early enough to, to cure it, or at least to give me some more time. When I first got the diagnosis, I was reeling. My first thought was, fuck, I'll be dead in a year. My wife, Lisa, on the other hand, went online and she started searching for resources. Her sister, Beth, did the same. Beth found the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, PANCAN, and they, she sent us some information. Lisa contacted PANCAN on my behalf, and they sent a list of area hospitals. That's how we found Northwest Community Hospital and Dr. Bill Amoria, whose knowledge and experience of the most up-to-date biomedical technology prolonged my life and gave me hope, at least for a while. If you know someone who has cancer, or you know someone whose loved one has, had, has cancer, please go the extra mile to treat them with compassion, it's like people have done for me and my family. Unless you've been through it, you just have no idea what it does to people. Here's a little insight. After two rounds of really heavy duty chemo, nano knife ablation surgery and intense radiation, I did enjoy a few months of remission. I actually felt pretty good until shortly before an MRI, I started to feel the same symptoms that I felt before we knew what it was. The MRI revealed that the tumor was once again growing. So my oncologist put me back in chemo. At this point, no medical professional has said, you've got X amount of time to live, or there's nothing more we can do for you except make you comfortable. But the nature of the disease and how it's progressing with me suggests that that conversation is inevitable and probably not too far in the future. The disease makes me feel like shit, but so does the chemo. I'm sitting here wondering whether my destiny is to progressively feel worse until I wish I were dead while the disease tortures me a while longer before granting that final wish. I'm wondering whether six to nine months of chemo can buy me enough time until the next treatment becomes available, or if I might qualify to participate in a clinical, clinical study of an experimental treatment. I also wonder whether the chemo is just going to prolong the misery. I wonder whether to cancel the treatments, go on a farewell tour while I'm still feeling somewhat decent, and just be done with it. I'm not ready to have those conversations with my, with my physicians yet, and I'm certainly not ready to have that talk with my loved ones. I want to live. They want me to live. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to watch them. I don't want them to watch me suffer. 
Did I mention how fucking cruel cancer is? Okay, but enough wallowing in self-pity. Michael J. Fox, who's been suffering from Parkinson's disease for many years, recently said, gratitude makes optimism sustainable. If you can find something to be grateful for, then you can find something to look forward to, and you carry on. Well, I can't change what I can't change, but I can acknowledge the people and the things for which I am grateful, and there are many. I said before, nobody really knows me very well. I've always been a private person. In fact, if you and I have shared a deep heart-to-heart -heart philosophical conversation, consider yourself among the few. So it's kind of strange that I'm telling my story now and on social media. How weird is that? Well, maybe I want to tell it because it is a story of gratitude. Up until the cancer diagnosis, my life had been really a series of for very fortunate events. I know that's kind of like Mary Todd Lincoln saying, up until the gunshot, I really enjoyed the play. <laughs> Nonetheless, I've been blessed with great parents and siblings, a beautiful wife, an awesome son, cool friends, and three fulfilling careers. It's easy to think of cancer as a curse, and believe me, it is. But I can't dwell on it, having had so many advantages in life. I guess I've been aware from a very young age that I didn't quite fit in anywhere. <laughs> Even in my family, I'm pretty eccentric. My brother-in-law once told me that as I was just learning to read, he saw me on the front steps holding an open book. When he asked what I was doing, I replied, I'm looking for interesting words in the dictionary. I used to do that a lot. I'm the only science geek in the family. As a kid, I was reading encyclopedias, watching Star Trek, reading sci-fi books. I still do. In fact, well, in spite of many of our differences, though, <clears throat> my family has always accepted me as I am and made me feel welcome, eccentricities and all, and I appreciate that. I want to thank you for letting me be myself again. Growing up, whether it was in the neighborhood or in school, I never felt quite like I fit in with the rest of the crowd. I think that became more noticeable in high school. I wasn't a good athlete, so I didn't fit in with the jocks or the cheerleaders. I didn't fit in with the smart kids because I was a rebel. I didn't fit in with the rebels because mostly I stayed out of trouble and got good grades. Mostly. Now, I promise this wouldn't be a woe is me story. In fact, it's the opposite. See, along the way, in whatever environment I happened to be in, I always managed to find a small group of other misfits who became my friends. In whatever group that was, we shared a few traits, but usually not enough to make those friendships last a lifetime. When I graduated from whatever school and moved on from the job, I went my own way and generally didn't stay in touch with the old crowd. Although those friendships didn't last, they really helped me get through that period of my life. I may be a misfit, but I've never been treated like an outcast, and for that, I'm grateful. In college, I made friends with a small group of misfits who seemed to be more like me. In other words, they were rebels who mostly stayed out of trouble and got good grades. And I'm happy to say that many of us have stayed in touch throughout the years. So, shout out to the Tech Bash crowd. But the gratitude really starts with my late parents, who are outstanding role models. They didn't have the benefit of the college education but they worked hard to ensure that their kids would. Nothing fancy, community college, state universities, but that education led me to three very successful and rewarding careers. More importantly though, my parents taught by example how to have a good marriage. Although they had traditional old school roles, dad was the breadwinner, mom was the homemaker, they enjoyed a very egalitarian marriage. All their major decisions were made jointly, they shared a mutual respect for each other, and they always argued fairly without insults. There was occasional yelling, you know, Sicilian ancestry and all. But there was never any doubt about their love for each other. They also taught me not to judge people based on their ethnicity, skin color, nationality, or religion. Before I left for college, Dad gave me this advice. Tom, remember where you came from. I remember. And they gave gave my son the same advice when he went away to college. Thanks, Mom and Dad. My siblings have always been really good to me, again, even though I'm a misfit. When I was young, my sister Sandy and my brother-in-law Dick used to take me to Buffalo to see the Bills, the Braves, and the Sabres play. They once took me out to dinner at this place called the Anchor Bar and introduced me to this new Buffalo fad called Wings. I also remember Halloween, a Halloween one year when I was sick and I couldn't go trick-or-treating. 
Sandy and Dick came over to our house with a big bag of candy, cookies, and treats and said, since you couldn't go trick-or-treating, we went for you. My brothers Lou and Paul both took me under their wings in various capacities. Lou was a city councilman in our hometown. He helped me develop my socio-political conscience. He also encouraged me to join his softball team as a teenager. I wasn't great, but I did enjoy playing. And when I was a college student and I was home on breaks, I worked at the bar he owned at the time. Made some friends, had some fun. It was a good experience. As kids, my brother Paul and I shared a bedroom for about 10 years. He helped me get through my early teens with great advice and a voice of experience. Paul was a bit, of, a bit of a rebel when he was young, so by the time I came along, Mom and Dad were already used to it. And he turned me on to some great music, including works by Elton John, Iron Butterfly, and The Who. I'm lucky to have grown up in a close family where we all look, looked out for each other. I also married into a good family. Lisa comes from good stock, as they say. Mom, Dad, Beth, Lance, Colleen, thanks for welcoming me into your family. Lisa, my beautiful wife, my soulmate in the truest sense of the word, the best friend I've ever had, and the love of my life. She's the one person who truly understands me, sometimes better than I understand myself. Without question, I'm a better man than I was three and a half decades ago, and this is a big part of the reason why. We've helped each other grow as individuals, and as a result, we've grown as a couple. Some people never meet their soulmate. Through a series of fortunate coincidences, Lisa and I met in our early 20s. I knew right away she was not like other girls. We got married less than a year later. Now, I would not recommend getting married that young or marrying someone you've known for less than a year. But at the same time, I wouldn't change a damn thing. Our life together has been a learning experience, an adventure, and overall, an amazing journey. Lisa, you are too young to be a widow. I'm sorry that I'm leaving you prematurely, but I'm confident that you'll be okay. Thanks for being here with me through the good times and the bad. Thank you for inspiring me to be a better man, not by lecturing or nagging, but by just setting a great example. Thank you for the strength and the courage you've displayed throughout this ordeal. And thanks for not complaining when I bought myself a new guitar or some accessories. In addition to helping me become a better man in general, Lisa's example as a parent has made me a better father. Our son Joe is generous, intelligent, and kind, with an admirable social conscience and a great sense of humor, and pretty good taste in music, too. I couldn't be more proud of him. When Joe was about four years old, I was leaving for work one day, and I said, Bye, Joe. Be a good boy today. He responded, Bye, Dad. Be a good man today. If that doesn't inspire a man to step up his game, I don't know what would. Joe, you're too young to lose your dad. I'm sorry. I guess the last piece of advice I can give you is to maintain your sense of balance between your idealism and pragmatism. Keep your head in the clouds and your feet on the ground. You've been granted opportunities and privileges in life. Take advantage of those opportunities and use them to help other people. Oh, and listen to your mom. She's been a great source of wisdom in my life. Thanks for making me proud, Joe, and for inspiring me to be a better man. It is unfair that my life is being cut short, just as I'm looking forward to full retirement. But you know, life isn't always fair. It's unfair that many people don't get the breaks and opportunities that I've had in life, like coming from a good family and having access to an affordable and quality college education, both of which really set the tone for my future. Career-wise, many people hate their jobs, but I'm lucky enough to say that in my professional life, there was never a day when I dreaded going to work. I enjoyed being an engineer at Accurite. Work was challenging and interesting, and I had good coworkers. I absolutely loved being a college professor. I looked forward to walking into that classroom every day, being the sage on the stage, watching my students have their light bulb moments. I also had some amazing colleagues who helped me grow as an educator and as a person. 
A few of my faculty friends have told me that I've been a role model for them. The funny thing is, the same people are some of my role models. And I'm happy to say that even after retiring from the college, I've maintained the friendships that I built up while there, even if it's just through Facebook or emails. My third career, technical writing, turned out to be more enjoyable and more lucrative than I'd anticipated. A few lucky breaks fell my way, enabling me to gain clients without having to market myself and allowing me to learn new technologies that are of interest to me. Writing combines the best parts of teaching, learning new things and sharing that knowledge with an audience, but without the grading and the campus drama. The transition from professor to writer was painless and I never looked back. So to my students, my colleagues, my clients, and my readers, thank you for helping make my careers more satisfying. It's easy to say that I've been robbed by cancer, but in the grand scheme of things, like I said, I've been very fortunate. In fact, when I think about some of the dumb shit I did when I was younger, I'm pretty lucky to have made it out of my 20s. <clears throat> I've had more pleasure in six decades than many people experience in a much longer lifetime, and I'll take quality over quantity any day. If life were fair, a lot of things would be different. I guess all we can do is take whatever privilege we've been granted in this life and use it to help others. I climbed the ladder of success, and I'm proud of that. But somebody else built that ladder. I can't reach the top and kick the ladder down. I have to help maintain it so others can climb it too. I can't make life fair, but I can try to equalize things as much as possible. I hope I've done so in some capacity, however small that may be. <clears throat> now to get a little philosophical. Lisa frequently asks me how I'm feeling. Once in a while, she'll be more specific and ask how I'm doing emotionally. Well, you know the stages of grief? Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. I'm kind of experiencing all of them all at once. Overall, I'm trying to really maintain a state of Zen, a form of acceptance, I suppose. Someone asked me how I could manage that, given what I'm going through. Well, the answer is one of the fundamentals of Eastern philosophy. I can't control what I can't change. I can just control how I react to it. It's easy to say that when things are going well, but if I can't maintain my Zen through the bad times, then I never really had it in the first place. I'm determined not to be the patient from hell, and really for two selfish reasons. First, I figure if my time is limited, why should I spend it being angry and making people around me miserable? Second, when I go, I want people to be sad, not thinking to themselves, finally that ornery old bastard is gone. Now, almost 20 years ago, Musician Warren Zevon was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. He was on The Letterman Show, and Dave asked him how he was coping with it. Zevon said that his new motto was, enjoy every sandwich. He went on to explain that he was determined to relish every moment of the time he had left, even if it's simply eating a sandwich. <clears throat> enjoy it. Savor it. Everything. Folks, we're all on limited time here. So get the most out of life by appreciating the small, everyday blessings that we have. Because when those blessings are gone, you'll notice it. Sickness will surely take the mind where minds can't usually go. Come on the amazing journey and learn all you should know. As far as regrets in life, I have very few. Mainly... I look at the times when I had a choice between being kind and generous or being a selfish asshole. Sometimes I chose the kind and generous route and I never regretted that. Other times I chose to be a selfish asshole and I've regretted every one of those instances. But most importantly, I don't regret being who I am, even if it means not quite fitting in with the crowd. Sometimes we live no particular way but our own. Sometimes the songs that we hear are just songs of our own. Long before the cancer diagnosis, I decided that life is too short to hold grudges. Since the diagnosis, the phrase life is too short to has taken on a whole new meaning. But anyways, in my heart, I've forgiven everybody who's ever done me any wrong. Whether it was intentional or inadvertent, personal or professional, it doesn't matter. I forgive you. Across the board, blanket forgiveness. And to those whom I've wronged in the past, and there are quite a few, I apologize, and I hope you can forgive me as well. Not for my sake, but for yours. 
you'd be amazed at how well forgiveness can cleanse the soul. Cancer certainly puts things into perspective. When I think about some of the things I used to whine about, they pale in comparison. I've always tried to live by the one, 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 one rule. How will this affect you in one hour, in one week, one day? Sorry, one hour, one day, one week, one year. Let that determine how much to fret over something. Cancer has also been a lesson on strength. We never know how strong we can be until being strong is the only option. Lately, I've seen a strength in myself and in my loved ones that I never knew existed. In many ways, their strength has bolstered my own. We may have lost the battle, but we gave it a hell of a fight. In his book Slaughterhouse-Five, Kurt Vonnegut, one of my favorite authors, described an alien species that sees time as another dimension, just like we see height, width, and depth. As such, they don't think about the past, present, and future the way that we do. From their standpoint, nothing ever ceases to exist. It simply exists in certain time frames, but not in others. When someone dies, they say, so it goes. The it can be interpreted, I suppose, as life or as death, since life and death are two sides of the same coin. In effect, death is the price we pay for life. I once heard that when you love someone, you trade souls. A part of them is in you, and a part of you is in them. When that person dies, a part of you dies with them, but a part of them still lives on in you. So live a good life, my friends, so the part of my soul that's in you can enjoy the ride. And now some thank yous. You know, after the disease was diagnosed, I gotta say I received top-notch care from the medical professionals at the Swedish American Regional Cancer Center, the UW Hospital in Madison, and Northwest Community Hospital in Arlington Heights. I wanna thank the physicians, nurses, and other staff for treating me with kindness, dignity, and compassion throughout my ordeal. We may have lost the fight, but you bought me some time and you made my treatments more bearable. And for that, I appreciate having had you in my corner. I also want to thank all the medical researchers and biomedical engineers for developing new cancer treatments and methods. When I first got to the, the diagnosis, I thought I'd be dead in a year. Now, 20 years ago, that would have been true, but the form of chemo, the nano knife surgery, and the type of radiation treatments that I received have all been developed over the past 5 to 15 years. Although they didn't cure my disease, they did buy me some time that I wouldn't have otherwise had. And new treatments really are being developed, some of which sound very promising. So if you find yourself facing cancer, even if it's pancreatic cancer, don't give up. The next treatment could be just what you need. Until a physician says otherwise, always assume there's hope. In addition to the aforementioned, I'd like to thank my family members and friends who supported me with cards, emails, messages, phone calls, thoughts, prayers, and food. I'd also like to thank all of my teachers in the past, especially those who wrote on my report card. Tom could do so much better if he would only imply himself. Well, you were right. To my friends, past and present, to my students, my colleagues, and especially my family, thank you for enriching my life. I love you all. Peace, love, namaste. Live long and prosper. Go Bills.